The story was submitted by Jeanette Overton. She says, hey, Jared, I absolutely love your heartwarming stories. Here's one about my great-grandmother, Osi. It's a story of tragedy, loss, faith, and community. Back when my great-grandma Osi was a young gal in the mountains of South Carolina, her daddy was a mean drunk. I mean, I reckon they say a mighty mean one. Yeah, especially to her, because apparently somebody had told him once that Osi weren't his, which weren't true, but he always believed it was in his mind when he got to drinking. So after years and years of torment of him coming home drunk, her having to go hide in the woods and stuff till the next morning. She just couldn't take it anymore. So she decided to round up everything she possibly could and take off. She packed up everything she owned and took her brother's horse one night when they got good and asleep. She traveled and went and went until she got into the Tennessee mountains. And then she just kept on traveling. And she kept traveling day and night. And then she finally made camp back in the mountains on a little old ridge. The next morning when she woke up, she stood up, stretched, and got to looking around. And saw that an old cabin was just above her up on the hill. So she said she went up there and Looked into it, looking around, and seeing that it had been long since abandoned for many a year. She figured she'd call it home. Straightening up, fixing things up where she could, and doing what she could, she was there for about a month, barely surviving from berries and things like that, and things she took from her daddy, like an old pocket wash and stuff to trade for food in a little old town she had found not far away. But after a while, food and things to trade was getting mighty scarce. And as about the time, worry was starting to set in. The great grandma Osi, throughout her childhood of abuse and stuff and everything, it didn't matter what she'd went through, she had always kept the Lord dear to her heart. And she noticed she hadn't prayed in quite a long time and was so afraid that the Lord had given up on her. But one day, after sitting around there looking at how skimpy everything was, she was getting real worried. So she got down on her knees and prayed her heart out. She always told everybody later on that whenever she was a-praying, a tear would fall with each word that passed her lips. Said when she got done praying, she decided to lay down and take a nap. Said when she come to, she awoke to voices, men's voices. Scared her half to death. Said she jumped up and got to peeking out the window there, seen two men standing outside an older one, and a younger one. She got to looking around, not knowing what to do, almost in a panic. She decided to run out past them, because there weren't no back door, and she could see that they weren't armed. She waited and waited, and with pure adrenaline, she shot out of there like a wildcat. Right as she was running by, I said that older fella reached out and grabbed her by the arm. Said, whoa, 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 hold on there, Missy. Said, we didn't mean nobody no harm. Said, we didn't know anybody was at home. Said, we hadn't been up here in a long time. 
So he let go over and looked at her and kind of held his hands up as, you know, in innocence and just kind of smiled. Said he had a kindness in his eyes. A kindness that said, he, you know, she could trust him. He said, this being old man Paul's place, said, you must be his kin. She thought a second and said, she'd lie. She said, it's again the Lord, but she didn't have no other choice at the moment. and She'd have to be, ask for forgiveness later. So she lied and said, yes, sir, that's right. He said, well, he was always like family. So it's good to meet you. So I'm John and this here's Thomas. So I live down the holler there with my wife. So I do the preaching here in these parts. Old Thomas here, so he lives just west of here. But he lives alone since his wife passed a few winters back. So she kind of nodded her head at him, said hi to him, so he said she was O.C. Pollard. She said, my family sent me up here to kind of keep an eye on the place. So old John Grant said, well, just yourself? She said, oh, well, some of my family traveled up here with me, and I told them I weren't scared. And I told them I'd stay here and keep an eye on it by myself. He said, well, God admire that. He said, but ma'am, he said, it's just you, you here, you know. I said, do you need anything? She told him she could use a little flour and a little cornmeal, maybe a little, little dab of grease. And he grinned said, yes, ma'am. Be glad to help. We'll be back before sunset. So John and Thomas turned around and took off back down the path. So she went back in and let out a big sigh. She sat there and was thanking the good Lord for sending them to her and was begging for forgiveness for telling them that lie. So she always told folks that she was kind of had a little bit of sense of peace to, after she noticed that she weren't there alone. Well, true to the word, they come back before sunset. Brought the stuff she asked for and brought some extra things too. Brought her some eggs, candles, some other stuff that John's missus had sent her. Well, as time went on, she started going to preaching with them, things like that. To Thomas, he'd come up there and escort her. And she met a few other folks in the area. Well, one night, she woke up to more voices. And one, she recognized her daddy. Well, said that right there sent her into a shock of a panic. Said she knew his sober voice, how he sounded when he was sober. And right then, right there at that moment, he was anything but sober. Said when he was sober, said he was the kindest, most gentle man you'd ever meet in your life. Said but the minute he started drinking, no matter what it was, the old devil come out in him. Said she was sitting there in a panic so bad she almost hyperventilated. So she eased up there and peeked out the windows. So there he was. Him and about five other men had it surrounded. So he yelled, come on out of there, Osi. I know you're in there. I'd know that horse out here anywhere. She looked again and seen that he was staggered and then got to look and noticed that every one of them was. She knew what that meant for her if she went out. He yelled out again. Come on, get out of here now. Take what's coming to you for taking off and let's get on back home. Said she's looking around, not knowing what to do. Time was ticking. Said she was still in a bad panic. Said that she only know to do one thing. Said the Lord helped her once, maybe he'd help her again. So she jumped down there on her knees again and started praying. So this time praying so hard, said her knuckles was snow white. And at the same time, she was crying so hard, she couldn't even hardly breathe. He yelled, last warning, 
Get out here now or I'm a coming in to get you. She sat still, waiting for that door to be kicked in any minute. But then, all of a sudden, everything went silent. Deathly silent. She sat there for a minute listening. Nothing. So she got up and eased up, barely up to the edge of the window, looked out past the curtain, and to her amazement, she saw John, Thomas, and the entire community outside. And her daddy and his friends were surrounded. Her daddy said he was taking her home because she had run away. So John told him, said, no, sir, I don't think you are. See, my name's John Potter. This here is my land. At least it used to be my land. You're trespassing on her land. She bought this place from me last week. So apparently she don't want you here. So leave and don't come back. Said her daddy looked at him and said, well, if you're an old preacher, man, you ain't gonna do nothing to me. Said so Thomas looked at him and said, yeah, but I ain't no preacher, man. And neither is the rest of us. Said so they made sure they left right then and right there. Said so a few of the local fellers followed them to make sure they really did leave. Said so John, Thomas, and a few other folks stayed there with her. Said so thankful as the day is long. She asked old John, said, why'd you let him carry on like that? Why didn't you say you was old man Pollard? So he told her, said, ma'am, so I'm a preacher, and I'm also an old man. Said, in my days, I've heard and seen pretty near to everything. Said, I could tell you was worried and scared, and not a fear kind of scared either. He said, the way I looked at it, the Lord sent me to you. And when the Lord sends me to somebody, I help them any way I can. See, when we seen them fellas passing by the barn out there by the path, we figured they was up to no good because this is the only place up around this way. So, here in the mountains of Tennessee, so we squabble inside our families a little bit here and there, but we sure take care of our own. Well, it weren't long after that, till Thomas, my great-granddaddy, who'd been the one escorting her to preaching, asked her to be his wife. And she gladly agreed. They had their ceremony right there at their local little church, and the whole community was invited. As far as I know, her daddy never returned. As far as anybody knows, and her brothers, Sisters, her mama, or nobody ever even tried to contact her or even see her. And she always said she was so thankful for it. Because the family she always wanted is the one she had. And she had the Lord to thank for it. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound that saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see Twas grace that taught